Hallelujah. Well, I'm here by default. It was Paul meant to be speaking today, but he, he called me on Friday and asked me if I'd, uh, if I'd speak today because something because he couldn't be here for whatever reason. So I've had since then uh, to prepare, and I've been working in between, and I'm going to work now after this. So, but, you know, God is in charge of time. You know, sometimes we think we need this much time to do this and how much time we need to do it. We don't, you know. God works from eternity, and we need to get into his program and never think about how it affects us. You know, there's, there's something that, uh, that I want to share again from Isaiah chapter 6. And it came to me on Thursday when I got the news of Queen Elizabeth. And it affected me more than I thought it would. It's almost like I knew her personally, but I didn't. <laughs> but it's somebody like I've known about all my life. And it was like, like I'd lost someone. I, I don't know why. Uh, but it affected me. And, and, and to think that it, it, you know, sometimes very macho when things don't affect us, so we can cope with it. No, it, it did affect me. And, and the next day, Paul asked me, Paul asked me to speak, but when that affected me, the Lord gave me a word. And it, it comes here from Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to share that with you. It's one of my favorite verses anyway. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the voice was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean, li unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs, with the tongs from off the altar. And he said, And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lord, this that touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy. And shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. I'll stop there. Seems like a strange commission. Go and tell these people. We're not going to listen to you. And it's in the year that King Uzziah died. Something significant had happened in the nation. Uzziah had been around for, I think, about 40 years. He was a stable king. I mean, he was a leper because he, he'd entered into the uh, temple and he tried to offer a sacrifice. And as a result, God struck him with leprosy. But he was still the king, although he couldn't do his function. But, but there was a time of stability in Israel. There wasn't, uh, we didn't have prophets come, coming up in challenging stuff. But then we had Isaiah in his first five chapters, he's going around telling the nation, ah, sinful nation, look what you're doing. You need to repent. This, this is what's wrong with you. This is what's wrong with you. You need to turn, turn away. And then in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw something. Yeah. Something bigger than himself. Something bigger than his doctrine. Something bigger than his theology. And he said, Boy, is me. For I'm undone, for I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He identified 
with the people that he was condemning. Why? Because we're all made of the same stuff. You know, by grace, we come into places that other people haven't. And until we have a bigger vision, we tend to stay in that place. You know, we tend to uh, identify ourselves by our theology or whatever. I, many years ago, I applied for a job in a Christian organization and you had to fill out those forms and give your testimony and all that. And then they, they got me for the interview. And they weren't, they weren't happy with the fact that I was a Christian. So what sort of Christian are you? I mean, I said, well, I don't actually have a thing. I said, yeah, but what would you say you were? I said, well, I suppose I'm Puritan at heart, uh, fundamental in what I believe, Baptist maybe in theology, Pentecostal in experience. They didn't give me the job <laughs> because I didn't fit <laughs> into what they wanted. And uh, I, was, I was in Ireland and I applied for a job with the... Um, I uh, can't remember what it was now, but it was one of these Christian organizations, and they gave the same thing. I gave my testimony at the, at the thing. So I'm being interviewed by Christians, but I didn't get the job, because that's not what they want. They want someone who's going to fit into the organization. Mm. That's going, and I don't blame them, you know. But this dynamic that we have that's from another place doesn't actually fit into our present system of church, our present system of how we think. And we've had this system for however long it's there. And we think it's normal. But until we have a prophet come up and stand, like Isaiah did, and then you see the change in his ministry, you see the change in how he approached things, because he had seen something bigger than himself. And this morning, that's really, that's really what I want to get hold of, that beyond what we think, beyond what we understand, we need to have a living, a vibrant, relationship. We did have a vision sometime about where we are at God or what God has for us. We have this idea that God has things for us and people come up to me and say, I know God has got something for me, but you know, I'm sure he'll show me at some stage. And I thought, well, no, God hasn't got anything for you. He's got you. <laughs> yeah. It's not the things that you do. It's who you are. He has changed you. And it's through that change, and whatever you're going to do for him, you're going to be changed. Mm. He's not going to get you to do something that you can do in your own strength. There's no glory in that. You know, I, my background is working with kids, you know, as a, like a, a social worker. Well, spiritually, I'm not good with kids. I, I enjoy kids for myself. But spiritually, God has got me working with people that I have no affinity with. Drug addicts, mentally handicapped people. I'm comfortable with people like that, spiritually. These are people I would have feared before I was saved. So God has me working with people or with, with people I have no affinity with because it's God. You know, when the Apostle Paul was on his way to Damascus and God confronted him, now this was a man who was steeped in Scripture. He knew that these this cult was wrong. He knew. And in his own understanding, it was right until he met with Jesus. And he says, why are you persecuting me? And so the very best we think, we're actually persecuting Jesus, but we don't know it because we don't have a revelation of him. Isaiah was going very well in his own little way. And then he saw the Lord. And he saw glory, something bigger than himself. And he needed something from heaven. And one of the angels came and touched his lips. There is a commission for us. And the commission comes from heaven. We, can't, we can choose what we want to do, but it only ends up in frustration. And we've got natural responsibilities. And we've got jobs, we've got family, we've got all, and those are all part of our ministry. But even for that, we need something from heaven. I remember when I was at Reto, I was with uh, Lance and Debbie, and, and she had, at the time she had three kids, and I don't know how she did it. And so she said, well, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't bring up kids if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, I like that girl. Because she understood that however good she was, because she used to homeschool as well, but she was an example to all of us. And I'd say to the guys, forget about Lance, forget about me. That's the example. 
she wasn't out there preaching, but she was, she was a, a girl that was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she put up with these difficult kids, and she put up with us. <laughs> but that's what being filled with the Holy Spirit is. It, it gives you something beyond yourself. And it's not about a spiritual experience. It's about having something higher. It's not about what's happened nowadays. It's like, you know, do you speak in tongues or don't you speak in tongues? It's become shallow. There's no, there's no glory in it because it's only a gift. But the anointing comes from heaven. The anointing takes you past your weaknesses, takes you past your failures. When God called David, he anointed him while he was looking after the sheep. And that anointing, he was anointed king then. And that anointing caused him to defeat the lion and the bear and Goliath. Mm. And he brought him into the presence of the king. And that same anointing brought resentment to the other king because the anointing had left him and was replaced by an evil spirit. So we are, I'm saying all this because I'm, I'm trying to bring your understanding to a, a dynamic that we're not used to talking about in church. We hear good sermons, we hear very good stuff. And yeah, I, I like that. I, I didn't see that before. It isn't about what we know. I mean, if I had to choose, I would be Amish. I like the way the Amish live. Yep, I'd be separate, you know, having to put up with anyone else. I, I love the way they live. You know, they live godly lives. But there's no life in it. The life from heaven isn't there. And so I don't need it. I need something that can take me into the depths of depravity and keep me. I need something that can destroy the works of the devil. That's what he said. Hmm. And these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And then he says, and nothing will hurt you. But we take that and then we, the theologians rationalize it. And then there's a big fear around it. But, you know, once you've seen the law, there's no fear. Yeah. Fear is indicative of people who haven't received something from the Lord. And every, every time I, I come, I'm, I'm always trying to get something from heaven to make a difference to my life. So when I speak from you, it's going to make a difference to your life. I'm not trying to impress you with my knowledge. I'm trying to impart something that's going to give you a breakthrough for your situation for today. Because that's what God's about. He cares about you more than you care about yourself. I mean, he gave his life for you. He's not going to do something else to prove his love for you. The love of God is constant. It'll be there tomorrow. It'll be there in spite of your sin. It'll be there in spite of your foolishness and my foolishness. You know, the hardest thing for me is knowing how much God loves me when I failed. It's really hard to take that. When I'm doing well, yeah. but when I've messed up, and then God shows his love to me, yeah. it's, it melts, doesn't it? It's easy to forgive somebody, but God, it's not easy for God to forgive. God, in his nature, cannot forgive, because he is holy. And so he had to make a way the propitiation of Jesus becoming sin for us. And it's through that he can forgive you. And it's through that he wants to forgive you. And through that he will forgive you. But if you come any other way, you think, just forgive me because, you know, like we say to each other, oops, sorry. No. We have to come his way. He's ordained a way. And as we keep coming that way, one day we will see something bigger than ourselves, like Isaiah did. And he deals with your self-righteousness. We have that... Whenever somebody has an encounter with God, we have it with Moses. Moses, when he was in Egypt, thought, there's a calling on my life. I've been in Pharaoh's palace. I think God's going to use me to deliver Israel. So he went and he killed an Egyptian. And uh, he got found out and he was on the run. So 40 years with the Midianites, he probably couldn't speak Egyptian anymore. And he probably couldn't speak much Midian because he was sheep all the time. And he had a wife called Zephyrah, so he was happy in the desert. 
And uh, so God came to him in the burning bush. He said, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. He said, now I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to tell him. He'd seen something bigger than himself. He'd lost confidence in his speech. It says in uh, Acts chapter 7, when Stephen talks about Moses, he was a man mighty in words and in deeds. Suddenly he can't speak. He said, now, now you can go to Pharaoh now and tell him what I've said. Yeah? God does things his way. But Moses had to see something bigger than himself. It was the same with Job. Have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like him. Then Job gets, he lets the devil loose on him. And Job retains his integrity until he can't take it anymore. <laughs> and he says, and then the Lord speaks to him and says, and he says, he says, I've heard with the hearing of the ear, but now I see. Yeah. And we need to see things. I'm not talking about having spiritual experiences for the sake of it. Because if you're going to go for spiritual experiences for the sake of it, you'll get them. But they won't be from God. Okay? This is about integrity before God. It's about integrity in the Word. It's about integrity in prayer. And let God's timing for when He's going to come to you come. But there's things we need to cultivate. We need to cultivate this discipline of prayer. We need to cultivate the discipline of being in the Word and allow God to come when He will. We can't dictate to God what He's going to do. He does things on His terms. This morning, I, I stood up and get, gave a word. I was reluctant because I'm preaching. I thought, well, I'm dominating everything. And it's, I'm very self-conscious about this thing. But if I hadn't, I would then, I would be disobedient. Mm -hmm. So it's not about my reputation. I don't care what people think about me. People don't think about me that well anyway. Except they should. <laughs> At the end of the day, the only person that really loves you is God. Mm -hmm. And I came to that place. I heard a preacher say it one time, and I realized, ultimately, he is the only person you can trust. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he is the only one that has your welfare at heart. Mm -hmm. There's no romance in it. He laid down his life. And that's what love is. Love isn't about romance. It isn't about feeling. It's about willing to lay down your life for someone else. Love in the church, that's what it's about. It's not about hugging each other. It's about being able to get past people's faults, get past whatever you can see, because we understand that we're all made of the same thing. And when Isaiah saw that glory, he realized, woe is me, for I'm undone. And then you had the Apostle John. Remember before the Lord ascended into heaven, they were very Jewish, these apostles. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Mm -hmm. And that must have been playing on jobs in John's mind for I don't know how long. And then in the book of Revelation, the Lord appears. He said, I heard a voice behind me. We always look in the wrong way. And God gave him a revelation of what was going to happen. And in that, there's a lot about Israel. If you read the book of Revelation right, you will see, how, yes, it's about the church, but there's a lot there when he talks about the tribes, when he talks about, and it's basically settling John's heart about what's going to happen. When the new Jerusalem comes down, it's going to be the, the tribes and it's going to be the apostles. Can you see what I'm saying? It wasn't for John to know these things until God was ready to reveal them to him. In the meantime, he had to preach the gospel. In the meantime, he had to do the things that he had to do. But when he got the revelation, when he got something higher than himself, it changed things. It changed things for us. I don't know where I'd be without the book of Revelation. It's the first book I read when I got saved, because I'm like that. I want to know how it ends. I'm no good at mysteries. I'm no good at who done it. You know, I want to know. And then I can read it because I haven't got the anxiety. It's the same with football. I can't watch a live match because I, my things. Once I know the result, I can watch it for the sake of enjoying the football. But I haven't got anything in my heart that's, that's going to go with it. So that's why, you know, 
That's why I love this word. It's a finished work. It is done. All we have to do is get into God's program. But getting to pro God's, God's program requires a discipline. Remember when, when I, I never went to Sunday school because I didn't get saved till I was 31. But when I used to go to churches, in the Sunday schools, they used to teach songs like, Read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. Did you, could you do that? <laughs> yeah, but things like that. But it's true. People don't read their Bibles and they don't grow. I mean, reading your Bible for yourself and coming to the knowledge of the truth. Instead of reading to ready, listening to ready made doctrine, ready made stuff. So you know a lot of stuff, but you've not yielded yourself to the word. You've not made the word the basis of your life. You've made the philosophy of the word the basis of life. So we have the Armenians, we have the Calvinists, and we have the Catholics, and we have everybody else. And we we'll all argue with each other. But those who know the Lord will do exploits. Because God has called us to higher things, but we need that revelation. And that's at God's discretion. You know, you can't put a gun to God's head and give me a revelation. But when this thing comes, when he came to Isaiah, he was a different person. When he came to Moses, he was a different person. When he came to Job, he was a different person. When he came to John, he was a different person. And I'm saying, and our need to grow requires constant revelation. So we don't rely on our knowledge and the comfort of our knowledge, and the comfort of our fellowship, if you like. Because all that does not enable us. I mean, I've been influenced by men of God, but ultimately, it's only what I've received from God that has made a difference to my life. Men of God have been an example to me, but I realized that they had something from another place. And that's what provoked me to jealousy. You know, they would come into the room and there'd be an atmosphere that they brought. They thought, how did they do that? They didn't. They weren't even aware of it. But I was. And I said, I want that. And wherever I go, that's what I want. But if I have it, I won't be aware of it. <laughs> I'll be aware of my foolishness. That's all I'm aware of. I don't put on the spiritual act anymore. I used to, when I first saved, I used to have this spiritual mantle I used to put on, you know, full of confidence. And uh, God in his love and his mercy took away my confidence. <laughs> and one of the things that I had to learn to deal with is my reputation. You know, you get a reputation for things and, and people know you for that. And then suddenly they, you take that mantle on. And then God just, like he did with Moses, like he did with like he did with uh, Job. Job was well known. Everyone knew what a righteous man he was. And then he lost his reputation. He lost his blessing. And then he saw the Lord. Yeah. Now it's not necessary that we have to lose all these things to see God, because we're in a completely different dispensation, okay? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the gospel. The saints in the past ages, they didn't, they didn't recognize this thing. They would be envious of us. Because we've got something that's permanent. The presence of God is always there. It's just that we take it for granted. We're not taught in church about the reality of redemption. That you are not, you're not who you were. When you became a new creature, you're not what you used to be. Remember that chorus that when he looks at me, he sees not what I used to be, but he sees Jesus. Do you have that comment? We can sing it in church. Then we go out there and, oh no, that bloke's cut me up again. But this is the reality. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in a sense, if we're really walking in step with the Lord, we don't necessarily need that revelation that I'm talking about that the saints of old had. But the reason we have it is because we are like we are. We're made of the same thing. And God in his mercy will come to us. He will give us a word in season. He will restore us. You know, he will heal, he will deliver, he will lead, he will bless, because that is what he's in the business of doing. 
because all power and all authority belongs to him. All we have to do is believe. But, but faith like that has to be cultivated. Okay? And it's cultivated by time. You know, when I was a young, young Christian, there was this thing, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you could say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And I thought, well, I don't need much faith for that. Mustard seed. But that's not what it's saying. It's not the size of the mustard seed. It's the endurance of the mustard seed. Okay? James gives an example of that in, uh, when he talks about Elijah. He said, Elijah was a man of like passions as we, as we are. But he prayed. Okay? And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed until God stopped the heavens. And then he prayed and he prayed and he prayed until... God sent rain. But he saw, you know, when he saw the answer, he stopped praying. And very often, we stop praying because we haven't heard anything. And we just say, well, I've prayed and it hasn't happened, so it's probably God's will not to do it. I don't know it's God's will. But when I've heard from God, he's always come through. I remember my friend Randip and when he was sick and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I hadn't heard anything. And then he passed away and it sort of broke my heart, but I realized I hadn't heard. He hadn't let me down. He hadn't told me he was going to heal him. When people have got healed when I've prayed, I've heard. And so I had the confidence God would heal. I didn't have the confidence. But I was, obviously I was hoping. And that's where most of us are, because we haven't learned to move in faith. We haven't learned to persevere. And the reason we don't persevere is because we don't have a higher vision than our own ability. Is that right? Yeah. We're all, I'm saying it about myself. I have too much confidence in my ability to allow God to do what only he can do. And therefore he has to come to me from time to time and say, hey, what are you doing? Because we get it our own momentum, our family, our work, whatever it is, that becomes the basis of our prayer. That becomes the basis of our life. You know, family and all these things God, God, God gives us on this earth are a blessing. But they're only for the time that you live on earth. You're not going to take them to heaven. When people start talking about heaven and the funerals and we're going to be doing this, you're not. Okay, I don't know where people get that stuff. Jesus said in the resurrection they will be as angels. They will not be marrying and given in marriage. So if you hear someone at a funeral say that, tell him. Upset the funeral, I don't care. We can't give people false hope. I can't say to someone, you're going to see your mother when you're up there, or see your dog or your horse. I don't care what people say. It's the foolishness of the of the natural mind. It's designed to give people comfort, but it's false comfort. I'm looking for the day when I'll see Jesus face to face. I remember, I, I told this story before when I was, when I was in India the last time. Uh, I was in the car, I was going to a meeting somewhere, I was meant to be preaching, and, this, and there was an ox cart on the other side of the road and the roads are very narrow, and there was a truck hurtling down behind there, and I thought, well, he's not going to overtake that ox cart before we get to it, so obviously he's got to slow down, but he didn't. He overtook the ox cart and came straight for us, and, and then by some miracle, the driver sort of moved around, and the car got damaged, and, but I didn't think about it. I went up there, I preached, and I didn't even feel anything. Whereas a few years ago, I was in India, and they drive like lunatics. And every time a car came, I thought I was going to die, and I'd be, oh! But this time, I didn't even know, it didn't even touch me. On the Sunday, the, the pastor got up and says, you know, I just want to thank God the other day how he saved our lives. And I thought, what's he talking about? Because I didn't see it. Do you remember I rang you, Cyril, when our car broke down? Because I said, what, what do we do? Cyril didn't come to help us out, only he stayed where he was, but I forgive him. <laughs> And, uh, ah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. 
No. And then I came back to England. At the time, there was a lot of stuff going on with the properties, and I, I was the guy holding all the money for the family now to distribute it. So it was, it was quite important for me to be alive, uh, I realized. But I was driving to work one day, and I thought, I could have been dead. I could have been in heaven. And I was really disappointed. <laughs> I was, and I thought, going to work or being with Jesus. <laughs> But that's what the love of God does. But I realized why he kept me alive. It would have been an awful mess for my whole family if I had died. But at the time, I didn't even know it because he kept me. And there was no fear. Yeah. Psalm 91. Yeah. The thousands shall fall at their side and thousands at the right hand, but shall not come nigh thee. Yeah. No evil will befall thee, nor any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He will give his angels charge over thee, for he will keep thee in all thy ways, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Is that real to you? Or is it just something we want to share in the meeting? And this is what I'm saying. We need a revelation. And this word has got to become life. And it'll happen as we cultivate, as we spend time. The most precious thing God gives you is time. And what you do with your time and what you do with your money will determine the kind of person you become. We got no excuses. Some of us might have more time, some of us have less time, but we prioritize. And I thank God for the, for the things he's given me, like even, even this job that I have. I have, to make, I have to make time to be in the Word and prayer before I go to work. I to, because I daren't go in without it. Yeah. I understand my need. Because I know what I'm made of. And we're all made of the same stuff. So we all need the glory. We all need the revelation. And you know, you have it. He's given you Christ in you, the hope of glory. We were made for glory. So lift up your eyes, get your vision into heaven. And in these coming days, watch God work in your lives. Amen. Amen.